Seches Ksubis Dav Ches contains two primary related sugas. The discussion of Birchas Chasanim, that's the seven brachos we say at a wedding and during the Sheva brachos. And then we'll go to Birchas Avelim, the bracha which used to be said for a mourner, the seven days of mourning, and that's not said any longer. The Gemara will also bring a number of incidents where people came to a wedding and halachas we can learn from what they did there. And we'll also talk about people who came to a mourner and halachas from what they did there. So let's begin. We start with the last two lines. On Dav Zayin, the Gemara quotes a brisa as to what the Sheva brachas are. So the brisa begins as follows: The brachas chasanim have to be said in the minion of ten people, and you have to have a panim chadoshos there. You have to have somebody who wasn't there at the previous one or at any of the previous ones, according to Rabbi Huda. Now the Gemara lists what the brachos are. So there is a lengthy explanation from Arashi as to how these brachas apply. So first of all, you have the bracha of Borei Gafin, which is not listed, and then you only have six other ones. Four of them are a bracha on the chasen kahal specifically. You have two that are introductory. The first one is a bracha on the kahal, on the tzibor, and everybody who came to help with the wedding. That is in the honor of a kaddish baruch Hu, just like he came and helped Adam and Chava with their wedding. So the bracha there is shehakol baral chvede. Everything was created for his honor. That's referring to everyone there. The second bracha is a general bracha on the creation of mankind, also not specific to this chasen and kala, which we're going to be speaking about soon. And that's the bracha of Yotzer Adam, thanking and Kajib Baruch for the creation of mankind. Then we get to the next four brachos, are the brachas specifically on the younger couple here. And the first is... This is the creation of man and woman. So he created man in his image. And he created from him an everlasting creation. That's womankind who was taken from him, who was separated from him at some point. And this one ends off with a barakat Hashem, Yaitzer Ha'adam. Then the next bracha does not start with a barakha Hashem. It just goes straight into the simcha of the young couple. So it's Vesagal Ha'akara. So first, before we get into the real simcha, we also have to mention Yerushalayim, of course. So we speak about the Avelis of Yerushalayim and the Akara, who is devoid of the Vesem Igdash, and they will restore to simcha. Then we can get to the actual simcha of tonight. That's Sameach to Samach Reya Mahuvim, special joy between these loving friends. Like the simcha of Adam and Chava in Gan Eden in the first couple ever. Baruchat Hashem, Mesameach Chasan Vekala. Here we're talking about being Mesameach the Chasan and the Kala, not together as a man and wife, because we haven't talked about their marriage yet, just each of them separately, they are Besimcha. And then we'll get to the actual wedding, and that's the bracha of bracha ta Hashem and the kedem melech elam asher bara sasa in Besimcha created joy and happiness. Chasan Vekala. Gila Rina, Ditsa Vechedva, Ava Vachva, Shalom Reyes, these are 10 or possibly 12 expressions of Simcha. And then, of course, our Tfila for the rebuilding of the Beit Amigdash, Meher Hashem, Lekin, Yisham, Bar Yehuda, Chutas Yushalayim, Kol Sasim, Kol Simcha, Kol Chasim, Kol Kala, Kol Mansaz, Chasan, Michal Pasim, On Army, Mishteni, Ginasim, we should hear the rebuilding of Yushalayim, we should hear Simcha in its streets of wedding, of Chasan and Kala, of Chupa, of youths playing. And Baruch HaTashem, Mesameh HaChasan, Im HaKala, here we say HaChasan with the Kala, because the Eds were referring to their joy in each other as part of their new marriage. Now, Rashi gives a lengthy explanation as to why some have a Baruch in the beginning, some have a Baruch in the end, and some have one and not the other. So Rashi says that in any time you have a series of brachos, the first one starts with baruch and it ends with a baruch, and then all the other ones only end with a baruch because they are bracha smuch lechavater. They're following a baruch, so they don't need a baruch of their own. Here, though, the first two just start with a baruch and don't end with a baruch because they're not related to the chas and kala. They're just general. You have a shehakol baruch and yetzer adam. Therefore, they're not part of the series. They each are just a baruch. Then you get to the bracha of that is the first of the series, starts with a bracha and ends with a bracha. So Tassus and Samech Tassamach follow the pattern like they're supposed to. They don't start with a bracha because there's smuchel chavrda. The last one has to start with a bracha, even though it shouldn't because it is sometimes said on its own. If you don't have a panam chadashas, you say just the last one, as we're going to see later. So that's Rashi's explanation. All right, now the Gemara goes into some things that happened when certain Amaraim came for a wedding, and certain halachas we can learn from there, and the Gemara's comments on some questions and answers based on that. So the Gemara says that Levi went to the wedding by Rebbe, 
he went to Rebbe's house by the wedding of his son, Shimon. Rebbe Shimon braid the Rebbe, Rebbe Shimon, the son of Rebbe Huda Hanasi. And he said only five brachos. He left out the bracha of Yoitzer HaAdam. Now, when Rav Asi went to a wedding by Rav Ashi, he said all six. He said Yoitzer HaAdam. So we have a machok as do we need to say Yoitzer HaAdam? Now, Yoitzer HaAdam was the second bracha, which we had said was a general bracha on creation. So the Gemara wants to say that their creation is their argument is over. Do you need two brachas for creation or only one bracha for creation? And that bracha is probably be, that machlok is probably based on a machlokist. The Gemara says, how many acts of creation were there? What do you mean? The Gemara says, well, first Hashem created Adam, then He created Chava. Was that a separate creation or was that part of the creation of Chava? There's a part of the creation of uh, Adam. So the Gemara says that's really dependent on machlokist, which we've seen in the Gemara in Erevin. The Gemara repeats it here. How was Chava created as part of Adam? How was she separated? One version is that they were created as one creature with two faces, front and back. The two sides were both a face. They were then separated into two. That's not called a second creation. It was just a separation. According to the other opinion, Chava was created from a rib or a tail, really. The Gemara says a limb that was taken from Adam and that was built into Chava. That's a whole new act of creation. So the Gemara wants to say, according to the opinion that it was two faces, so there was only one act of creation, you only need one bracha. According to the opinion there was two creations, you need two brachos, one for each. That's the opinion that it started as a limb. So the Gemara, not necessarily is that the Machlokas. It could be that everybody agrees that it was only one act of creation. However, there was an original thought, as it were, as an original intent. Of course, the Kajimbo doesn't change his mind, but he had as as if there was an original thought to create two separate creations, and then he decided to create them as one. That means that, of course, he wanted to create Adam and Chava separate, but he wanted them to be begin as one so that they could come back together in perfect unity. So this... Machlokas then would be, do you follow the original thought, and therefore there's your, you would need two brachos for the two creations that were originally planned, or do you follow the actual creation in which you had just one, and you wouldn't need two brachos? So that would what that would be what the um, machlokas actually is. All right, says Gemara. Further, Rav Ashi went to a wedding by Rav Kahana, and the first day he said all the Sheva brachas, all seven of them. From then on, for the rest of the Sheva brachas, for the next seven days, he only said if there was a Panam Chadashos, he said all seven. If there was not, then he said this is not a new Simcha, you don't have one new here is joined, just an extension of the old Simcha, and therefore he said the bracha of Sha Simcha Bimauno, which we say in the Zimun. And he also said from Sheva brachas, he only said Asher Bara, he only said the seventh bracha. Now from day seven until day 30, he said the bracha of Shasamcha Bimono without Asher Mbarah, and then afterwards it depended. If he if people were invited because of the original Simcha of the wedding, then he said a bracha of Shasamcha Bimono. If there was no, if they were just invited without being told it was for the wedding Simcha, then there was no bracha at all. So the Gemara Simcha Bimono went how long? You said after 30 days, but how long did it go? More said 12 months. Until 12 months away, you could still invite people and say this is based on the simcha of the wedding and still say a bracha of simcha b'ma'ono. Says Gemara, when can you start? We said he, we begin from the wedding. When can I invite people to celebrate the wedding before the actual wedding and start saying sha simcha b'ma'ono? So the Gemara has a bit of back and forth on this. So the Gemara first wants to say it's from you when you put the hops in the vat, when you start to make the beer, that is the first preparations for the wedding itself. Says Gemara that Rav Papa, uh, who's the one who said this, he himself started earlier. He said it already back from the Agerson, from the engagement, which, which could be as early as a year before. Whereas his was different, he was very wealthy, and therefore he had people to do the work for him, didn't need to worry about the work, and therefore he could start saying the bracha right away. Now, Ravina made a engagement between his son and the daughter of Rav Chaviva, and he started saying already from the time of the Ereson, from the time of the engagement, and he explained that I know that they're not going to break the engagement because I can afford to pay my responsibilities, and if I don't need to worry about it, I could start saying the bracha right away. In truth, it didn't work out that way, they did break the engagement, and they never actually got married. Now, Rav Tachlifa Bar Marava from the West came to Lavel, and he did six long brachos, six brachos that started and ended with a bracha, with a varuch. So that was longer than we have. So the verse is, Allah is not like that. We do the brachas the way we have it, not longer. 
Rav Chaviva went to Vemahula, and he said the bracha of Shah Simcha B'Ma'onu. That is, he went to a bris milo, and he said Simcha B'Ma'onu by the bris. Says the Gemara that Allah is not like him either. You don't say Simcha B'Ma'onu by the bris because people are distracted and hurt by the pain of the child. Okay, now the Gemara goes to Minusugya, which is going to take us into Avelim. So we have Birchas Chasanim and Birchas Avelim. So we're going to compare the two. So the first thing we'll do is compare, do you need a minion for them? So Birchas Chasanim, we know you need a minion. It said it in Abraisa before. What about Birchas Avelim? So the Gemara quotes Rav, who says Birchas Avelim, you need a minion. But unlike Birchas Chasanim, the Avel does not count towards the minion. Birchas Chasanim, the Avel, the Chasan counts as part of the minion. Berchas Avelim, the Avel, is not part of the minion. Rabbi Yochanan also said, Berchas Chasanim, the Chasan, is part of the minion. Berchas Avelim, the Avel, is not part of the minion. Gemara says, Akasha, on both of them, a Verbaisa that says, both Berchas Chasanim and Berchas Avelim, the Avel, is part of the minion. So Gemara says, not Akasha on Rav, Rav is a Tana, he could argue on the Braisa. What about Rabbi Yochanan? So Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan wasn't talking about the same thing as the Braisa. What did you say? Berchas Avelim, you're talking about different things. The Brisa was referring to the Zimun. That is, you can count the Avo as part of a Zimun, the three people. When we say Mini, we don't mean ten, we mean a count. You can count the Avo as part of the Zimun. That's not an issue. He's Chayv in a mitzvah, just like everyone else. Riechon was referring to Shura. When, you leave the, when a person leaves the cemetery, so the mourners are comforted by people who stand in two rows, and they say Hamakom Yenachem to them. You need a minion for that procedure, and uh, the Avel doesn't count as part of that minion. That's what Yochan was, what he was referring to. So it's not a contradiction between Yochan and the Bryce, they're talking about different things. Someone says that can't be, because we have an expanded version of what Rabbi Yochan said, where it's clearly not talking about Shura. Rabbi Yitzchak quoted Rabbi Yochanan, who said, Berchaz Chasanam needs a minion, but Berchaz Avelim does not mean a minion. So he said, Berchaz Avelim. Uh, he said, I'm sorry, he said, you need a minion, but the Avel doesn't count as part of the minion. Now, there's no bracha by Shura. You don't see Berchaz Avelim by that consolation. So the Gemara says, okay, so Rabbi Yochanan was talking about something else. He was talking about the Berchaz Avelim that takes place at the first meal when the Avel comes back. To the place he's going to sit shiva, the neighbors come and they bring a meal, it's called Suda Savara, and there you say a special bracha, bracha Savayim, which the Gemara is going to explain soon. We're not familiar with it because today we don't say it. So the Gemara says that can't be either. That can't be what Rav Yechanan is referring to either, because we have another expansion of this, where we have Rav Yitzchak quoting Rav Yechanan, and he says that you say Berchas uh, Chasanim for seven days, and the Chasan counts. You say Berchas Avelim for seven days, and the Avel does not count as part of the minion. Now that Suda Savara, that does not count, and that's not something that goes for seven days. For the entire Avelis, you don't say a special Bracha by that uh, Suda Savara. You don't have Suda Savara for seven days. Says the Gemara, you're right, but you do say Berchaz Avelim for longer than the first time. Every time there's a Panam Chadashos at a Suda, you, for, for the Avelim, you say, they would say Berchaz Avelim. Now the Gemara is going to bring a lengthy story. What we see in the story was that people said Berchaz Avelim on the second day of the Avelas, which shows that you could say it even after the first day. And we'll also see from there what the Berchas Avelas actually are. This will take us from most of the rest of the dafs. And the word says the incident was as follows. There was Rav Chiyabar Abba. He was a Rebbe of the son of Reish Lakish. Two different versions if he taught him Psukim or if he taught him Shnayis. Either way, he was the Rebbe. And the Rebbe Abba lost the son and he was sitting Shiva. So Reish Lakish did not go to be Menachem Abba the first day. The second day he did go. And he took with him his Maturgaman. That's the one who spoke for him. His spokesperson who was Yehuda Bar Nachmeni. So they went and they sat down, they were being Menachem Avel, and Reish Lakish told the Menturgamon to say Berchas Avelim. So he said, first of all, he said, say something uh, for the um, for the loss of the child, say some Divrei Tanchumim of some sort because of what happened over here. So now we have two versions as to what he said. According to the first version, the child who was lost was young, he was a child, not a teenager, and he quoted the Pesach as follows, Vayar Hashem Vayinat, so Hashem got angry, Mikas Banav Uvenosov, because of the anger of his sons and his daughters. So he gave the Drush as follows, generation where the fathers, anger Kaddish Baruch Hu, Hashem takes it out on the children, and the children are lost because of the avarice of the fathers. Now, 
The second version is that the son of Rav Chia Barava was a teenager, he was a vacher, and he said as follows: Al Kain Bachurov, Al Bachurov lo Yismach Hashem, Vesisoma Vesal Menosov lo Yerachem, Kikul Ochanov, Umera Vachol Pe Dover Nevola Bachol Zos lo Shav Apov Od Yodiv Netuya. So this pasuk means that the teenagers Hashem is not happy about them, and the orphans and the widows He does not take mercy on. All of them are doing chanifa, they're uh, groveling and doing evil, and their mouths speak nevala, disgusting things, all the time. They his anger is not returned, and his hand is still stretched out. So the Gemara first of all explains. What does it mean that his hand is still stretched out? So the word ve'od is, the drush is made that it's va'ad, which is for one's entire life, meaning for 70 years. And it's saying as follows. Somebody who speaks nevola can change his decree of good to bad, even if decree for 70 years from good to bad. So it's Rav Hanan Barav who says that, and he expresses it as follows. Everybody knows why a kala goes to the chuppah. Everybody knows what's going to happen afterwards. But somebody who debases his mouth to start talking about it, that is nivul peh. And even if he had a gazar din of 70 years of good, it could be changed to 70 years on the bad side. Okay, so now the Gemara has a question here. He was supposed to be saying Tanchumen. Instead, what he ended up saying was sounded like a very painful thing to say. Either he blamed the father for the death of the son, or he said that this is a fulfillment of the Psukim, the saying, what's going to happen when you do bad things? So what's he saying to him? Your son was killed because of your Averos. How is that a Tanchumen? So the Gemara was saying, he was saying as follows. He was saying, you are so Chashav that you can actually atone, you can take responsibility for the sins of the generation. This is a... A uh, terrible thing that happened. We know that the generation is wicked, and their uh, responsibility of the fulfillment of these psukim goes on you as a leader. So it was really a compliment to him, not an easy one to hear, but it was a compliment to him. Okay, then Rish Lakr said to the Mentorgumon, say something as a praise for Akachish Baruchu. And now is when he started saying Berchas Avelim. And he said, Akela Godal, Berev Godloy, Adi Berchazak, Berov and Aros, Machaya Mason, Bima Maro, Osegadolis, Adin Heker, and Eflos, Adin Mispar, Brachata Hashem, Machaya Mason. That was the first brach of Berchas Avelim. The God, the great, in his great goodness, the strong. The mighty, the awesome, who brings the dead back to life with his words. He does great deeds which cannot be scrutinized and wondrous things that cannot be counted. Baruch Hashem, who revives the dead. Okay, that was the first bracha. The next one was, he said, say a bracha for the Avelim. So he said, Achenu hamiyugayim, my brothers who are stressed, hamidukam, who are depressed, be'evel hazeh, with this morning. Tenu levavchem lachgar esizos, place your hearts to research the following things. This is something which goes on forever. Loss and uh, loss of life is a never-ending part of existence. It's a pathway that continues from creation. Many people have had to drink this cup. Many people will drink it in the future. People drank it in the beginning of time. People will drink it in the end of time. May our brothers... Those who can console them, and they console you. Baruch Menachem Avelim, blesses he who consoles the mourners. The Gemara interrupts the story here. What Abaye says, I don't like this text here. You should not say things which seem to curse us that we're going to be having more loss in the future. Don't say many people drank and many people will drink. You just say many people drank, but not. don't say it about the future. Don't say the drink of the early ones is the same as the drink of the later ones. Just talk about the early ones. This is like Rish Lakish used to say, and like we learned the price in the name of Rav Yossi, don't be poseach pel with Satan. Don't give an opening for the Satan to be mekatreg. Don't say about, do not invite bad things to happen. So Rav Yossi, we actually see that concept of pesachon pel with Satan from a Pasuk in Yeshayo, where they say, Kistom Hayinu la Amora Diminu, they compare themselves to Stoma to Amora, and right afterwards the Navi speaks to them and he says, Shimbudvar Hashem Katsine Sidom, he starts calling them Sidom. So if you open up and you say things like that, you're going to get it right back. So we shouldn't say things like this. 
Okay, back to the story. So he said to the Menturgum, and he said, Okay, now say a bracha for the Menachemim, those that are being Menachem the Avelim. So he began and he said, Achinu, Gaimle Chasadim, my brothers, those who do kindness, B'nai, Gaimle Chasadim, a son of others who also do kindness, those who uphold the bris of Avram Avinu, Hamachzikim, Bervisu, Shal Avram Avinu, Achinu, Baal Hagamul. My brothers, those who reward Yishalim Lachem Gemulchem should reward you your proper reward. Barchata Mishalim Hagmol Blessed are you who rewards actual deserved reward. All right, now we get to the last bracha from the set. He said, "Say something for all of Klal Yisrael." So he opened and he said, "Rabbi Nehalam, Master of the Universes, Pidei Vatzel Malei Toisha Amchal Yisrael." Four expressions of salvation. Your nation Yisrael min. Hadever, Mena Cherev, Mena Biza, Mena Shidafon, Mena Yerokon, Mikomini Peronia, Samasvakshus of Osla Olam, Terem Nikrev, Ata Taane, Brachata, Otsar Hamagefa, save from plague, from sword, from destruction, from different types of winds that destroy crops, all kinds of disasters which come to the world before they even open their mouths to pray, you should answer them, Brachata, who stops plagues. And there you have all the Berchus Avelim, and you clearly see that this happened on the second day of the Avelis. So therefore you know that this is something which can happen later if there is a Padam Chadashos. It doesn't have to be only on the first day. All right, now the Gemara goes on to continue discussing some of the uh, customs that they did when they were Menachem Avelim. This is one which we certainly do not do today either. So Ula says, we have a brisa that says that they would give at a suda that an oval would eat, they would give him 10 cups of wine to drink. They were metake to have 10 cups. The wine is supposed to help take the edge off the suffering that the oval feels. And the 10 were as follows. Three at the appetizer, at the uh, things which were meant to open the intestines. Then there were three in the middle of the meal. And that's to give the food a good soaking up. And then there were four during Berchus Amazon, one for each of the Berchus de Raisa of Berchus Amazon. Those are Hazan HaSakol, Berchus HaOretz, Boni Yerushalayim, and Hatov Vehametiv. And there was a time when they added four more, and that was one for the Chazani Ha'ir, those who took care of the dead and the Kavura. There was one for the Parnasei Ha'ir, those who helped financially take care of those who couldn't afford the burial. There was another for the Beis HaMikdash, which is part of every morning procedure. We remember our own general uh, national mourning for the Beis HaMikdash. And the fourth, interestingly, was for Rabban Gamliel. In his honor, they would drink a cup. So there were 14 cups at some point, but people started getting drunk in the middle of their Avelis. That probably didn't work out too well. So they decided to go back to only 10 cups of wine. Now, some Rishonim disagree with the Rashi's Prad here. Based on the kasha, which you're probably thinking, which is 10 cups of wine is enough to make anybody drunk as well. So they therefore explain this Gemara differently, slightly. Now, the Gemara just explains why did Rabban Gamil deserve his own cup of wine. So the Gemara says that in the beginning, the expenses for a kvura were very high. People would use very fancy clothing as the shrouds, and people couldn't afford the burial at all. What was happening was that people who couldn't afford it were just leaving the dead and not doing anything, leaving them for the public funds to deal with the burial, and it was a problem. So Rabbi Gamliel took matters into his own hands in order to solve this. He was the most hush of person there. He was also wealthy and he was also the Nasi, but he, whenever he had to do a kvura, he used simple flax cloth, the simplest material that there was, and people followed him. If they saw that he could do it, they as well. And therefore, from then on, the burials were used very simple and cheap materials. Um, Rav Papa says today people use sackcloth, tzarda barzuza, it costs a zuz for the entire thing, and therefore it's very cheap and affordable.